All right, uh, good afternoon, folks. Thanks for coming out. Uh, it's about start time, so welcome to this afternoon's talk on Mastering Modern Pass for the Enterprise with Azure App Service. I am Stefan Shackow, one of the many folks who works on App Service. Uh, I've actually been with the service since its inception, so I've seen it launch um, and I've seen it mature and grow over time and specifically mature to a point that I'm actually able to give you the kind of talk and walk you through uh, the kinds of high-end enterprise features that we're going to be looking at this afternoon. So what do we mean when we say modern pass or modern platform as a service? So the first thing is we support all of the canonical app workloads that you would expect to run uh, that you know listen to HTTP. So there's the meat and potato web app workload, of course. We support what are called mobile backend as a service. So those are the things you run in the cloud that ultimately a client mobile app needs to connect to in order to transact business. Uh, we support API apps, which, right, they're just web apps that talk JSON, REST API interfaces, things like that. And then the newest and most recent addition to the fold are Azure Functions which I somewhat jokingly referred to as if, it's, if you've got a piece of app code that doesn't neatly fit into the bucket of an API, a web, or a mobile backend, there's a pretty good chance it would run perfectly as an Azure function. Uh, just as a quick side note, uh, one of my peers in the team, Chris Anderson, gave a talk this morning uh, going into a deep dive on Azure functions. So if you want all of the details on that, uh, you can also look up that video once it's online and, uh, and watch his session. So, okay, we support a, a multitude of app types, but we recognize that those apps need to be run in a secure manner. And so that includes both app level authentication and authorization, and also network level security. And I'll show you today examples of being able to do both those kinds of security, right, the canonical layer four and layer seven security with apps running on our service. The next point is, again, we recognize apps don't exist in a vacuum. Uh, it's a nice idea if we can create greenfield apps that only exist in the cloud, but that is typically not the reality for most companies. So you need to be able to access existing resources. Those could be existing databases, web service endpoints, you name it, that exist on premises. And then similarly, being able to leverage resources like your existing uh, Active Directory investments. And so we as a service have a number of ways to be able to do that. And again, you will see examples of that throughout the talk this afternoon. And then last but not least, once you get up and running on us, of course, we want to make sure that you can grow. So if your apps are more, po more popular, you're ramping them up into production with more customers, we give you a number of options to be able to run on bigger VMs, run on more VMs, and then most importantly, being able to scale out and run around the globe. So that means being able to deploy and run your app workloads closer to where your customers exist anywhere in the world today. So most of this talk, what I'm going to be doing is stepping through four different uh, demo apps and scenarios. Uh, what I'll do in each case is I'll start out just sort of running it here from my laptop or from my phone so you just get a flavor of it. I'll walk you through the high-level architecture so you see the pieces of app service, how we plug them together, and then I'll dive into the portal um, and some of the sites and some of the code so you can see how things have been set up in the back end. So the first thing that I'm going to use today is it's a sample app uh, that we call Contoso Moments. It's actually available up there on GitHub. And what I did earlier is I deployed the app onto what's called an app service environment. So uh, I know a number of you, because I've talked to you uh, before, have either investigated or looked at app service environments. The, uh, the quick sort of 30 second explanation is it's a premium tier offering in our service that uh, what we do is we literally, we shrink Azure app service down and we put it directly into a virtual network topology that is under your control. And we think that gives you the best of both worlds, which is it lets you run app workloads on our service, take advantage of our DevOps and our manageability, but it gives you the isolation and the security peace of mind that it's running within a network boundary that's underneath your control. So I took this sample app, it's just like a little sample photo album, and I put it on an app service environment. It's got both anonymous access allowed, so you can see here I haven't logged in yet, and the app is also built to use the app service authentication features. And so what I did earlier is I set up just a little demo 
Azure Active Directory, and I wired up my app so that if I log in with users from that Azure Active Directory tenancy, I get access to data in my app that requires an authenticated user. And so you can see here I'm logged in, and now suddenly I can see, oh great, there's a private photo album. So as you would expect for a photo album, it's got various pictures, you know, you can drill in, and underneath the hood when you upload images onto the service, we have some background code that will automatically crop the pictures and resize them. And then of course, because it's a photo album, you'd also expect that you can go out and upload pictures. So let's go out, we'll choose, in my case, I'm just gonna choose a very small image just in case the network is a little less than optimal. And what's gonna happen is I've uploaded the image underneath the hood into the app and it has background code running using an Azure function that we'll look at in a little bit. And the Azure function is taking care of the sort of non-interactive background logic that's necessary to say, here, give me three different sizes of the image and go write them into blob storage underneath the hood. So this is all great. This is all running in my desktop browser. I'm gonna hop over here to uh, my iPhone and we'll give it a sec to come up. And you'll notice in this case, so I'm already on the login page for the exact same app. So the folks who put together this, this little demo app for us, they also built an Android and an iOS client. And I'm going to sit here and try to log in with the exact same credentials that you saw me using earlier. And that's just to prove that I can go out and run workloads on app service that allow me to use the exact same sort of backends and the exact same customer credentials to give them access to my app. And so you can see now that I'm logged in, I'm able to see, oh, sure enough, I have access to the public photo album and I, and I also have access to the private photo album and I'm also able to see that picture that I just uploaded you know, a minute ago running the desktop app. So I'm able to run, in this case, web workload, mobile backend workload, We'll talk about it in a little bit, the APIs that this mobile app rely on, and also the Azure functions in the background that take care of actually running the, uh, the image resizing. So let's take a quick look at the, uh, the sort of architectural overview of how we put this together on the service. So the first thing we did is we created a virtual network, an Azure virtual network, and a subnet in the, Azure, in the Azure virtual network. And we deployed that, in my case, in what's called the West US2 um, Azure region. And then I created an app service environment. And so like I mentioned earlier, this is the idea where we can sort of shrink down our service and give you a miniaturized version that's isolated, deploys into the virtual network, and it's guaranteed to only run your apps and your workloads. And then from there, the rest of the way the apps are put together, they work the same way as they do in the public service. So all of my apps run on an app service plan, which should be familiar to folks who have used us uh, in public Azure. And behind the scenes, what I have running is I have a, just a straightforward MVC app, and it also doubles as the API backend to the mobile app. And then in addition, I've got that Azure function that's doing the image resizing that's also running on this dedicated app service plan. Now you saw that I logged in to get extra access to the app. So I've set up my uh, application to make use of this entexample.com Azure Active Directory. My client, like I mentioned, calls into the APIs. And then similarly, the client is able to do what's called server-directed login against Azure Active Directory. So I can have the exact same customer base, ex exact same users, and they can go out and authenticate and authorize regardless of whether or not they're on a client form, uh, on a mobile form factor, or on a you know, traditional desktop or browser-based form factor. So with that quick intro, I'll flip back here to my laptop, and what I wanna touch on just very briefly is you know, in order to get all this stuff going, I keep on saying, hey, we had to go out and create an app service environment, so I'm not gonna go into all of the details here, but just if you're curious, if you haven't done it before, you come in here, you go new, web plus mobile, scroll down a bit to the bottom where there's the choice for the app service environment. And the salient thing that you're going to ultimately do is you'll make two choices, two really important choices. You're going to have to choose the virtual network and the subnet that you want the app service environment to go into. 
So that's the point where you're going to get control over the network boundary that sort of uh, circles the app service environment like a moat, as it were. And then the other thing is, this is a recent addition because we just rolled it out in July, uh, you're going to tell us if you want an app service environment that is internet facing, aka external, or if you want one that is integrated with what's called the Azure Internal Load Balancer, which that's a lot of syllables, so we just call it an ILB enabled ACE. And the idea is if you choose an ILB enabled ACE, as you can sort of guess from the name, that app service environment and all of the apps on it are effectively hidden from the outside world because the IP address associated with that ACE and those apps is completely internal to your virtual network. Now another thing that I also just want to quickly touch on, this is more a matter of a sneak peek, so I apologize, I'm going to show you a screenshot um, as opposed to walking through the portal, because literally we're doing this work as we speak, but we are going to be rolling out some updates to the app service environment feature here as we move later um, into the year. And the first thing is that we're going to be integrating the app service environment creation process directly into the app service plan creation process. So I know it's a lot of app service concepts um, all coming together. But the reason why we're doing that is a lot of you that we talk to, you learn about app service initially using our public multi-tenant service. So you have those concepts in mind. And what we do see and we hear is sort of understanding the complexity of the app service environment can be a bit of a usability stumbling block. And so what we're working on is a flow where you will be able to go new app, Oh, by the way, like for example, in this example, this screenshot, I'd like the app to be in South Central US, but when you drill into the pricing tier, what's going to happen is you will see new, what we call pricing cards, and they will show you options that when you click on one of them are going to create your app inside of a brand new app service environment inside of your virtual network. So hopefully it'll be a little bit more visible to folks and it'll be a little bit of a more natural flow. The other thing that I just wanted to call out and I highlighted it here is we're not only just readjusting the flow, we've certainly heard the feedback, so the plan is to introduce D-Series V2 support when we roll out that new app service environment functionality. So as you, most of you know, those are beefier, much more powerful virtual machines, and traditionally they haven't been available yet on app service, so we'll be rolling those out. And then also we plan to make more storage available to apps that run on the app service environments. And we're also going to raise the instance limit so that you don't have to call us up and log a support incident. So the plan is if you want to run up to effectively 100 D-series V2s, uh, you'll be able to just do that self-service without us um, ever being involved. And then this is just sort of the other part of the screenshot, right? After you choose the fact in the pricing picker that, hey, I want one of those high-end app service environments, like I showed earlier, ultimately we'll walk you through choosing your virtual network where you want the ACE to be deployed. You'll click create and then you'll be off to the races. So like I said, it's not quite there yet today, but um, stay, tuned, uh, stay tuned for it because this will be showing up in the portal in the not too, too distant future for everybody. All right, so I'll jump back into the main portal here. And the first thing I want to take a look at is that uh, MVC website the one that's actually running both the presentation tier as well as the API backend uh, for my mobile client. So I'll drill here into the details. And when it comes up in the portal, what I wanted to sort of point out is you'll notice in addition to telling me what region of Azure it's running in, it's also got some extra info. And this is sort of the hint, the giveaway that tells you, oh, it's not only running in West US 2, but it's running in West US 2 in your private app service environment, in this case, this ACE and EX internet, which is the name um, that I gave it. And then if I drill into the app service plan, we'll also see everything that's deployed in it. So once it pops up here, we'll see that we got two apps running inside of the app service environment. One of them is our web app, and the other one is we deployed our function app into it. Now, if you happen to go to Chris's talk, or you know, if afterwards you go watch his talk about functions, you'll hear that he talks a lot about serverless, which is one of the you know, great things you can do with functions. When you run in an app service environment, though, it's your private world, which also means all your private compute resources. 
So instead of going serverless, what you do is you just create the function app in a regular old app service plan, and then from there you still get all the benefits of the binding, the automatic triggers, the much easier programming model, and so now you've got access to all that great functionality in Azure Functions, but you get it inside of your own enclosed space there that's running inside of the VNet. So that's sort of what things look like just from the point of view of how we set up the app and the app service plan. I want to jump into how we did the authentication uh, for this application. So in app service, you know, this is sort of the layer seven, right, in the, in the uh, OSI layers, the, the kind of authentication that you can do. So you can do app level authentication with a feature called app service auth. And you'll notice that we integrate with a number of different OAuth capable providers. So it's not just Azure Active Directory. We've got Facebook, Google, and Twitter. And what you can do is you can enable an app and tell it, hey, I want to make use of that authentication feature that Azure App Service has. And there's sort of a very easy way, um, and almost an automatic way of integrating with that, where if you turn it on, and if I, for example, selected login with Azure Active Directory instead of what's highlighted, what will end up happening is any access to any URL inside of my app will immediately trigger a redirect to whichever identity provider you chose and then you go log in you know, with your Facebook or your AAD creds, and then after the redirect brings you back to the app, you'll be logged in. And that's actually great. Uh, we use that actually ourselves inside uh, Microsoft on Azure App Service for a lot of our internal tools where it's very easy. You just know everyone in the world needs to be authenticated before I run anything in this app. In our case, though, for this application, obviously we did not do that, and we said allow request no action, which is basically telling us if you're authenticated and I see an OAuth token, great, I'm gonna go set up some information for you on the HTTP context, but if I don't see that you're authenticated, that's fine, I'll let you in. And that's why earlier you saw that I was able to get to the public photo album because the app is like, yeah, sure, you wanna go see the public photo album? I don't care if you're logged in, come on in. And yet, I could go ahead and explicitly log in to get access to those more restricted resources. So when you set up app service authentication with an app, uh, you basically have the express mode and the advanced mode. And express, like I said earlier, we will do a bunch of things on your behalf where literally we will automatically call out to Azure Active Directory, we'll register the app, we'll wire everything up. Now we recognize that, again, in the real world, the person sitting in the portal or inside of Visual Studio may not be the one who has the rights to set up things in the corporate Active Directory. So that's why we specifically picked advanced, and what we did was we went over to the older portal, went to our Azure Active Directory, and we manually created an application, which you can see here, Contoso Moments example. And then inside of that application, we could go out and we could configure it. So doing things like saying, hey, you know, where do I actually go after you're logged in? And then a bunch of this, you know, the client ID, these sort of low-level values that have to be shared between apps. Now, if you want like all the details on how to do it, it took me all about five minutes to set things up. This is the article we have out on azure.microsoft.com for our service. We have info on all various uh, you know, uh, pieces of functionality in our service, but specifically, this article will step you and your security architects through how do you manually set things up in Azure AAD so that you can connect an app, an app service, to that AAD tenant. So once we did, that setup, the net result is my application will go out, and like I said, it'll read those OAuth tokens if they're available, but there's still a little bit of assembly required, which is I still need something that triggers the authentication to actually occur. So at this point, I'm gonna jump into Visual Studio, and this is the actual, you know, the solution in the project that I pulled down from GitHub for Contoso Moments, and I wanted to highlight the sort of two different paths that the code can go through. So for example, here I'm in the get all album method. So that's the thing that gets called when you come into the page and say, hey, what are all the photo albums that you should be able to see? And you can see it's like, okay, great, it's MVC, it's got a route. It's not gonna sit there and actually force me to go log in. But on the other hand, if I start scrolling down a bit, you'll see a lot of the other actions I can take with the album are attributed with this MVC authorized attribute. And this just happens to be the way the MVC framework works. You know, you can go out and hand code your own authentication logic, you name it. But the critical point here is if I try to, as an example, delete an entire photo album and I'm not logged in, 
MVC is going to say, hey, there's no authenticated principle associated with this request. I'm going to return a 401. And then what happens is our authentication infrastructure and app service, we see that. And we see the fact that you told us, hey, uh, go integrate with this Azure Active Directory. And so you don't have to write a stitch of code beyond literally putting in that authorized attribute. We will catch the 401. We will redirect over to Azure Active Directory and ask you to log in against the correct AAD tenant. And assuming your login is validated, when the redirect comes back to us, we will get posted to us an OAuth token. We will automatically do all the grunt work of unpacking it and creating a principle and sticking it on the context and all of that. You don't have to write a line of code. And now when the redirect brings me back to MVC, it's going to say, oh, OK, you're logged in. Great. And then if you want to do deeper uh, integration with business logic and go check some of the claims on that principle, we set that all up for you again automatically on the context. So we save a lot of the heavy lifting that you would normally have to do if you want to wire up and do OAuth authentication with third-party providers. Now, conveniently, I'm in the delete album method, and this gives me a good segue into sort of how the background logic uh, that we have implemented in our Azure function works. So if I drop in here, I'll see, okay, great. If I delete an album, I'll see somewhere along the way here, I'm calling this image controller, and I'm saying, yeah, I, I want you to go do something. And if I jump into that, you'll actually also see the, the delete image call does the same thing. In both cases, it doesn't appear that at the point in time that I, for example, delete an image or delete an album, it doesn't actually look like I'm actually doing anything inside of the MVC app. And that's true because all my web app is doing is this just putting a message on a queue saying, oh, by the way, uh, I think something needs to be done. And then it immediately returns back to the browser. So that should be a somewhat familiar pattern if you've done anything right with e-commerce, um, any kind of line of business apps where you have some kind of heavy-duty background processing. One of the typical struggles you have is, A, you don't want to inline it right in the code that's running the web page, and B, it's completely possible the person developing the web app or the API app doesn't necessarily know how to write the code that does all the background gyrations. So it would be great to sort of separate that out, throw it over the wall and say, hey, somebody else, you go, you go figure out what to do. So that's what we do. We throw a message onto a queue, and then if I scroll down here a bit in uh, the Solution Explorer, you'll see that I have a function project. And if I drill into some of the uh, <clears throat> code here for the delete images function, I have a declarative definition of how I want the data to flow into the function, and then the logic. So for example, here you'll see we're using the function declarative binding syntax that tells us I want you, app service, I want you to automatically listen on a queue. So that's what queue trigger means. And specifically, I'm telling Azure Functions, go listen on a queue called delete request. And when that data shows up, I want you to figure out how to deserialize it and pass it in on this blob name parameter. And literally, this is my function. Here's my run method. There's my blob name parameter. And you'll notice it's a you know, proverbial POCO, plain old C-sharp object. And so again, you don't have to write any code to say, oh, how do I actually listen on a queue? And then how do I make sure if I drop the connection, I reestablish listening on the queue? And then when something does show up, how do I deserialize? And like all that, all that sort of boilerplate logic that at the end of the day, all of us end up writing over and over and over again. We do that for you. You just tell us, queue trigger, listen on queue, pass information into me as this object, and I get it automatically. And then, again, I'm not going to go into all the details in terms of the rich binding syntax we have, but in essence, the rest of this declarative syntax here is there to make it very easy to also give me a reference to all of the actual blobs sitting in the underlying Azure storage account, which is holding all of the pictures that get uploaded, as well as the three different image sizes that this function is responsible for creating. So all I do is I just basically set up the method. I say, hey, app service, give me the reference to all the data I need. And then I asynchronously, in this case, I whack all the images that were sitting underneath the hood and blob storage. And this is all running off to the side in the function so it's not cluttering up and it's not slowing down the mainline code path in the web app. So let's jump back into the portal. And in this case, I've already drilled in ahead of time into the, uh, the details for my Azure function. 
You know, over here, there's sort of a, a little bit of a different UX experience when you drill into functions because we also happen to include a code editor and the ability to set up a lot of the more common functionality without having to drill all the way into the portal. But what I did here is I then clicked through and I said, hey, can you give me the overview of the function? Just to, again, prove that this function is running in West US 2 and it is running inside of my private app service environment. So I'm able to use that brand new feature, but I'm able to use it inside of my isolated ACE. The other thing I did is uh, I, ahead of time, just to sort of save the login overhead, I also clicked through into the, uh, the Kudu site or the SCM site as it's known. So if you played around with app service at all, you know that we have sort of a diagnostics developer tool bench um, and also an endpoint that things like web deploy or GitHub, other source code control providers can integrate with. And that is this SCM endpoint. And one of the things you can do with it is you can log into it and sort of run some various tools like Process Explorer. And you can also get a nice little uh, console experience where I can click around and look at the underlying file structure of my Azure function. So in this case, I'm going to drill into the log files for my function. And let's take a look at, uh, is it resource image? Or excuse me, resize image. And sure enough here, you can see me when I ran it earlier today, but you can also see here 9.28, uh, and it's, it's printing it out in UTC time. But that's basically, that's the hit from when I just uploaded that Microsoft PNG a few minutes ago. And this is the log telling me that, yup, the, the function in this case was listening on the blob container. It detected the fact the image showed up, and it carried out the logic that I wanted. And then similarly, if I take a look at the uh, delete image, so earlier today I went out and you know, was testing this stuff, and so of course I cleaned up my image. And so you can see earlier this morning the log from the delete image function where after I was doing a dry run, I said, okay, let's go clean up that image so I can upload it again. So again, just sort of proof that, yeah, there's a really slick way, really very useful way to run this sort of business logic off to the side, and you can still take full advantage of that um, inside of the app service environments. One last thing that I want to touch on here in the context of the, uh, the Contoso moment sample is that the folks who put it together, they, they did a great job in also making it possible to automate setting up this example. So a lot of you, I'm sure, have worked with Azure Resource Manager. So you know, you know, hey, what's an ARM template? Great, it's a way to sort of parameterize and remember how to set up anything in Azure, including us app service. So you can create ARM templates that will create apps, app service plans, app service environments, you name it. And the reason why I wanted to call it out here is you see there's an Azure Deploy JSON and an Azure Deploy Parameters JSON file. Now in this case, because I created the Contoso Moments example on an app service environment, I actually had to tweak those ARM templates a little bit because the sample they have out there on GitHub works on the public service. But if you're going to deploy onto an app service environment, you do have to tell us, hey, by the way, don't go put me in South Central US. Go put me in my ACE that happens to be in South Central US. And so you can see here, I've pulled up my modified parameters file. And you can see, like, for example, in my parameters file, I have to give it the name of the ACE. And West US 2 happens to also be where that ACE is. So if I take a quick look here and drill down to the server farms, uh, portion of my ARM template, this is just sort of ARM ease, as it were, for an application service plan. And you might notice it here, like hosting plan name, things like that. So the extra stuff that I had to do is I modified the Contoso Moments ARM template to include the references to the hosting environment, which is, again, the ARM syntax for an app service environment. And you can see here the name, and you can see here the, uh, the resource syntax. And then I also had to tell what I had to tell the app service plan what worker pool to deploy on. Because again, there's that extra little level of complexity when you're dealing with an app service environment. And then don't worry, you don't need to go out and you know, somehow remember um, how to do all of that. So if we go to uh, Azure Quick Start Templates, this is a great gallery of all kinds of ARM templates in Azure. It's not just us, it's hundreds of templates. So VMs, SQL, you name it. And if you come in here and search on app service environment, you'll see that a number of folks, myself included, have uploaded ARM templates. And so if you're looking for an ARM template on how to create an app service environment that's public facing, I've got a template that you can start with. If you want to create an ILB enabled 
uh, app service environment and then configure the SSL cert for it. I've got two templates and there's a companion article that will walk you through how to do it. And then for, in the case of Contoso Moments, I literally, I took this template that I've got my mouse over and I referenced that. I looked at the syntax and that's how, you know, again, for all of you, if you're wondering how do I do the same thing, look at the template and you can see the extra lines that are in there that reference the worker pools and AKA hosting environment, which is the underneath the hood syntax for an app service environment. And that's the extra stuff you include in your ARM template. And now you can automate creating apps and app service plans and deleting them all day long on an app service environment using an ARM template. Okay, so I will flip back to the uh, deck and we'll talk about sort of the next scenario that I want to walk us through. So I wanted to quickly show a little bit of a more involved example that uses Azure Active Directory authentication, but specifically uh, with an AD domain controller that also has an ADFS endpoint set up. And I, folks have come to my talks in the past. Uh, there, there's a little app, a travel app that I've used over time. It's actually somewhat funny because not only has the capability of that app grown over time, it's grown along with the capabilities in the service. So it's been a, a sort of interesting historical snapshot of how we do things over time. But it's a great example of, again, just taking a, a plain old web app on our service that authenticates with an Azure Active Directory. But the twist here is, we also set up an IaaS VM up in Azure and installed just Windows Server and Azure and, excuse me, Active Directory on it. So it's just it's a plain old domain controller running up there on an IaaS VM. We also configured it with an ADFS endpoint. And then what we did is we federated our Azure Active Directory with our on-premises directory and also told Azure AD and said, hey, by the way, when you're doing the login, you do the logins through me, through my ADFS endpoint. So let's take a quick look at that in action. I will jump back in here into Chrome in a new window. Go to my travel app. So the very first thing is, OK, great. This app is running on app service. And you can see clearly it's, uh, it's protected. So we're saying, hey, you got to be logged in to use this app. And after a little bit of a pause, if we take a look at the URL here for uh, for where I'm going to, you'll notice, even though I'm on a login page, I'm clearly not on the Azure or the Microsoft provided AAD login page. I'm actually on the login page that's coming off of an, off of an ADFS endpoint. So we'll go ahead and pop in the password, assuming I remembered it right. And once we're logged in, it goes through the redirects. It will successfully bring me back to my app that's running on app service. Underneath the hood, it happens to be on an app service environment. It realizes who I am. And so great, I've been able to successfully log in with a user credential, but the actual authentication occurred, quote unquote, on premises, not through Azure AD. And then just to sort of drive home that point, if I quickly drop in here into uh, one of my RDP sessions, I'm actually beamed in here to the IaaS server where we have the domain controller running and where we have ADFS set up. And I just logged in as me, so that should be familiar, right? Those were the credentials I just typed in, stephsch at contosaweb.net. So I just, I wanted to call out that example because if you're talking to folks, security architects, uh, folks who are heavily involved on the traditional on-premises AD side of the house, you know, you can absolutely start building apps and services on us, on Azure App Service, and you can absolutely compose those apps with your existing on-prem investments in Active Directory. It doesn't mean that you lose any of your users or lose any control. You can have basically the best of both worlds. All right, so we'll hop back to the deck and intro the next scenario. So this one I called multi-tier app topology because I want to step through a little bit of a more a complex layout where I have a couple of different layers in my app stack and we'll walk through how it's set up and how it works. And what I've done is I've created a, a simple MVC app that's gonna be internet facing. It's going to call an API app that is not internet facing. And that API app is gonna call a plain old traditional SQL server on IaaS VM, which is meant to sort of simulate, hey, I have a backend database that nobody is supposed to have access to outside of my corporate network. 
So first I'll show it to you running in the browser, just so that you sort of see, great, what's the app doing? And then again, we'll dive into uh, the architecture and how it works. So I'm going to go to www.entexample.com, so a nice friendly host name. Great, you know, nice familiar starter page for my MVC site. And in this case, I've wired things up so that I can drill into a page that underneath the hood is using the REST Sharp library to create a proxy that calls my backend API. And again, I'll drill into it in more detail, but this URL you see right here, this is actually the URL of my backend API. And then the internal implementation of that API app is that it uses Entity Framework to just go out and query a table in my SQL Server database and return it back. So I've got three layers here running around inside of my application. So let's take a look at what that, what that looks like sort of from a high level. So once again, we start out with a virtual network, again, in the West US 2 region. And first, I have sitting off in one of the subnets, like I said, just plain old traditional SQL Server installed on a, on a virtual machine. And as many of you have done before, you know when you create a virtual machine, you get a network security group by default with it. I didn't make any changes to the NSG, so I can RDP to the SQL Server and that's about it. The only network path that is available to get to port 1433 on that SQL Server is if the originating call comes from somewhere else inside of the same virtual network. So I cannot be like sitting up here on my laptop, you know, connecting to a public VIP and querying data off of port 1433. So my sensitive database uh, resources are completely hidden from the outside world. Now the second thing I did is, again, I used the relatively new capability to create an internal load balancer app service environment. And since that's far too many syllables for me, I'm just gonna use my slang term ILB ACE. And so I created an ILB ACE inside of a subnet that's also in that same virtual network. And then I, when I went out and I created the little web API app in Visual Studio, I said, yeah, go, go stick it on this ACE, and you'll see it in a little bit. It's actually tagged as an API app. Now, because of the fact it's in the virtual network, it has a clear network path to that backend SQL server. But I also put a network security group on it so that I could actually get access from my management plane to the ILBAs. And I'll touch on that in a few minutes, what I'm referring to on that. So remember, I've got an NSG on the subnet that contains my ILBAs. And then the last component is I created yet a second app service environment. And this one is internet facing. So it's in yet another subnet. I, of course, allow access from the outside world because in this case, my intent is everything I'm running on this ACE is meant to be accessible from the outside world but out its back end, because it's in the same virtual network topology, it is also able to connect to that API endpoint. So I've got a multi-tier topology where I have a guarantee that all of the back end traffic, my app calling the API, the API calling the database, it's all guaranteed to run solely inside of the virtual network. It is never going out on the internet and that traffic is not even going out on what we call the Azure Regional Network. It all stays secured inside of your VNet topology. So once again, jump back to uh, my laptop, and what we'll do is we'll just start walking through the different layers and, and sort of how things are put together here. So I'll start out in the portal, and once again, sort of take a look at the resources I have in this subscription, and the first thing I want to look at is my API app. So we'll drill into that, and you'll see that when the details come up, um, first off, you know, let's confirm, yup, it's running in West US 2, and definitely it looks like it's running on an app service environment. So great, it's hidden. Uh, you can sort of tell from the icon that, yeah, it's, it's considered an API app, and what that basically means is that in the API app, for example, we've set up what's called a, uh, a swagger endpoint, so again, I just did this to sort of show, show you and, and drive home the point. You can run any app type on app service inside of a private app service environment. And as a quick sort of 30 second you know, explanation like, hey, why should I care about API apps being sort of known as a special type in app service? Um, if the API apps are accessible from the outside world, what happens is other services like Logic Apps, which is a companion service to Azure App Service, 
um, they are able to, through ARM, query your subscription and discover the fact that, oh, you've got an API app. And then it can look and say, oh, you've got an API definition endpoint. And so it helps to sort of bootstrap things where one service like Logic Apps can realize there's an endpoint. And OK, great, now I know how to go generate, for example, an API wrapper. So it makes it easier how to connect the two. But OK, so that's, that's sort of the API app running on the ACE. Let's actually look at the app service environment itself. right? So I keep on referring to this ILB-enabled ACE. And so I've got a couple of different um, ACEs actually set up here. I'm going to drill into the internal facing one. And how do I actually know that this is an internal facing ACE? So let's take a look at a couple of hints here. OK, we're in West US 2. First thing is, if you happen to have ever used app service environments before, this is going to look different to you. Typically, when you create a public facing app service environment, we are going to give you a default subdomain that includes Azure Websites.net within that host name. And the reason why is in a public facing ACE, what you're basically telling us is at least minimally make sure that the host name entries show up somewhere inside of the DNS zone that is us, Azure Websites.net. But on an ILB enabled ACE, the whole point is the thing's hidden from the world. So we're not going to create any apps on that ACE and go stick them in the Azure Websites.net zone because that sort of defeats the purpose. So you have to tell us what subdomain do you want to use as sort of the default wildcard subdomain for all of the apps that run on this app service environment. And so just like you can create an app foo and bar and baz.azurewebsites.net out on the public service, with this subdomain, now you can go out and create foo.entexample.com, bar.entexample, baz, et cetera, et cetera. So it gives you the same experience of creating apps, but it uses a subdomain that's yours, that's underneath your control. The second piece of the puzzle is you'll see here it's, right, it's not grayed out. I can click on this entry here in the menu for ILB certificate. And if I take a look at it, you'll see that I've already uploaded a certificate that gives me SSL for the wildcard entexample.com domain, as well as for scm.entexample.com. So that's an important point. You want to remember that when you create the certificate that you're going to use as the default wildcard certificate for an ILB ACE, make sure to include the wildcard for your domain as well as that second entry, that SCM dot whatever. Because SCM, that's the endpoint for web deploy, for source code control, for the diagnostics workbench. And if you don't do that, you're not going to be able to connect to it or use it over any kind of SSL. And then lastly, if we take a look at the properties for this app service environment, it's going to tell us both the inbound IP address for all apps that are running on the ACE, as well as the outbound address. So you'll see here, I've got a virtual IP address, you know, the one that's going to accept port 80 and 443, and clearly that is a VNet internal address, right? In my case, you can guess my virtual network is carved out of a 10 dot range, and so I've got in my subnet 10.1.2.8 is what the Azure ILB assigned to this app service environment. So that's what you're going to set up in your internal DNS, and that's how you're going to connect to all of the apps running on this ACE. Now, I wanted to also point out, though, notice the outbound IP address. So what this is really saying, to be clear, is if an app on this ACE is calling out to, quote unquote, the internet, and the internet means something that isn't inside of your virtual network, so if for some reason your app needs to call all the way out to the internet, then the, the NAT address that it will present to the outside world, it's going to be this public 13.66. whatever address. However, if your app is going to call some other endpoint inside of the virtual network, the source address is going to come from the subnet address range of the A's. So I know that's a lot of concepts to sort of throw all together at once, but the top level thing is, if an app on an ILB ACE calls someone else inside of the same VNet, it's going to use a VNet internal address. It's never going to end up presenting a client IP that came out of a public IP address range. And then again, because like I said, I know it's a lot of concepts. We've written this up uh, in our doc collection. And if you look here, there's an article, Network Architecture Overview of App Service Environments. 
It's got a couple of uh, nice pictures and explanations, but it basically explains in more detail exactly what I was talking about. So when you're sitting down with security architects, network engineers, and trying to figure out, great, I got my app, it's gonna call something in the outside world, and it's gonna call my database, which IP address is involved, this will help remind you of what's going on. And I was gonna say questions, I'll take them at the end, so don't worry, I'll, I'll get to you. So that's, that's what I wanted to point out in terms of, um, you know, what's the IP address of the ACE, what's the outbound IP address. Next, what I figured we'd do is actually sort of show this in action. And what I did is I set up an RDP session to my backend SQL server. And the reason why I did this is it gives me a convenient VM that's inside of the virtual network, and ergo, I can actually get to my API endpoint. And one of the things I wanted to call out is Sometimes, because we see this uh, when customers ask, they'll be clicking around the portal and they'll say, hey, uh, can I go browse into the Kudu console, as it were, for my app on my ILB-enabled ACE? And the answer is no, it won't work, because guess what? The portal's all the way the heck out here in the internet, and you're hidden all the way the heck over here inside of your virtual network, and right? The two aren't going to meet. So when you start thinking about apps on an ILB-enabled ACE, probably the one thing that's going to be a bit of a a speed bump is you're not going to have seamless network access to it anymore. You're only going to be able to get to it if you're somewhere inside of the same VNet topology or routing infrastructure as the app on the ILB-enabled A's. And so in my case, the way I solved it is like, well, my SQL server is in the virtual network, so I'm going to beam into that, and as a result, I can actually get to my API endpoint. So let's see that. So you can see here I've already got the browser pulled up and already logged in, and I just wanted to zoom in a bit. You'll see here, adventureworksdb-api.scm.entexample.com. So that's the Kudu endpoint for my API app running on the ILBAs, and I am able to reach it. Now, in my case, I'm getting the, uh, you know, the complaining red bar here, and that's because I don't have a corporate CA, so you can guess what I did. I just did a self-signed certificate and uploaded it and said, here, you, go use this as my, uh, as my uh, default wildcard SSL cert. And you can see it's got the wildcard entexample.com set up, and then very important, we go over to the, uh, the SAN attribute, subject alternative name, and you'll see I've also wildcarded my SCM endpoint. And so now, even though it's not a trusted certificate, I do have an SSL cert that can handle HTTPS traffic, both for my apps and my SCM endpoint. So let's jump over to the debug console. And I want to show you and introduce to you two tools that have been around for quite a while. Uh, and they're very, very useful for helping to sort of debug connectivity questions and issues. Uh, when you're working with apps on ACEs. And this is true of regardless an ILB ACE or a public facing ACE. And for that matter, these tools also work uh, on any, uh, any app running on app service. So you can also use this in the public service. So the first one is a tool called Name Resolver. And if you want to check and confirm that from inside of your app running on our service, and like I said, this will work anywhere, public, private ACE, public facing ACE, you can use it anywhere. And you want to see, first step, can I actually resolve a host name to an IP address? Beam in here to your Kudu console, go name resolver, put in the endpoint you're trying to resolve, and see whether or not it works. Like, if it doesn't, you'll get an error. Maybe you're looking at the wrong DNS. You'll get back some wacky IP address. It's clearly not what you're looking for. But this is the first troubleshooting step. Now, in this case, this is the endpoint for my SQL Server IaaS VM. So it looks like I can resolve the address, which is good. So the next step is I'm going to use a tool called TCP ping. And we're going to see whether or not I can actually establish a TCP IP connection to port 1433 on my SQL Server box. And you can see, sure enough, not only can I resolve the host name to an IP address, I can successfully connect to SQL Server. So this gives me confidence that, guess what, my API app that's running inside of my VNet, it looks like it can actually talk to my database using a VNet internal IP address and successfully connect. So okay, great. Looks like the API app is actually going to do what I want it to do. The one last thing I wanted to touch on while we're RDP'd in here is jump over to FileZilla and again, pick your favorite FTP uh, transfer tool, and I've already set up the uh, user ID and password and all that so that I can FTP in to my app. 
And you'll notice here, right, we just connected to 10.1.2.8, port 21, right, the FTP control channel. And I'm able to actually get that connectivity. And then again, if I drill in here a bit, I'll drill into site. We'll go to the dub dub root, and we'll pull up the web config and go take a look at it. So yeah, discard it, and let's look at that file again. So at this point, I'm literally, I'm live beamed in with an FTP client to my ILBAs, and I'm surfing around the file structure of my API app. And so you can see here, like, hey, here's this connection string, AdventureWorks DB. And I'll touch on a bit, how come my app worked, even though my connection string says placeholder, which clearly is a completely bogus connection string. But I wanted to call out this example and show it to all of you because, again, just sort of hammering home the point, you do need to think for a split second about how you're going to publish your code onto an ILB-enabled ACE. Again, it's internal. It's inside of your network. So wherever the heck it is you're pushing your code from, it has to be able to have network connectivity to either the Kudu endpoint or the FTP endpoint. And that's, Im that's important to bring up because if, for example, you're using, let's say, GitHub or you're using VSTS, right? Those are both services that are, hi, I'm over here, I'm in the internet. They're not, there's no way for them to reach in and go touch your app that's running inside of your virtual network. Now, on the other hand, if you happen to be running like on-prem TFS and uh, Visual Studio with a whole build and CI process, there's a very good chance, assuming you've set the routes up, that you can probably run an on-prem build system. And when the build's done, you can go publish directly to the publishing endpoint of the app running on the ACE. And that'll work swimmingly well, because everyone's in the same network topology. So keep that in mind when you start playing around and deploying with apps um, on an ILB-enabled ACE. OK, so we've looked really heavily at sort of the, uh, the API app. Going to jump back into the portal. And this time around, let's take a look at the front-end MVC app. So I've got a couple of versions of it, one of them running in West US 2. So we'll jump into that, pull up the details. So once again, great, it's running in West US 2 on my ACE. And what I want to do here is once again jump into the Kudu console, go over to it. In this case, it works seamlessly. It'll come up here in a sec because it's an internet-facing ACE, and I haven't locked it down with, it, with any network security groups. So the whole redirect and transparent authentication that goes on with AED, like all of those redirects and posts can actually succeed. Once again, I'll dump into the uh, debug console. And this time around, what I want to see is, can I successfully get to my API? Actually, I think it's AdventureWorks db-api. So let's first see whether or not I can resolve the host name. So yes, I can. So my MVC app that's running on the public-facing ACE is able to resolve the uh, host name of my API app. And then similarly, let's see if I can get to, oop, let's see if I can get to the IP address and actually ping it. So sure enough, it seems to be working, right? I'm able to TCP ping, in this case, port 80 on my API endpoint. So this is the case of the MVC apps running in an ACE that's accessible from the internet, but out the back end, it realizes, oh, I'm talking to an API app that's inside of the same virtual network. So it's going to talk privately over 10.1.2.8 and go call up port 80 and say, hey, go, go carry out that API call. So my public ACE can call my private ACE, and my private ACE can call my private database. And that, in a nutshell, is sort of the quick walkthrough of how you can use our app service environments to run in a more lockdown environment. Uh, two other points I did want to touch on uh, in this topology. The first one is coming back to our internal facing ACE. If I take a look at the virtual network uh, that I've uh, set up here in West US 2 and drill into it a bit, take a look at the various subnets I have set up. So one thing to always keep in mind with app service environments is you can only have one ACE in a subnet. And the subnet, at the time you create that app service environment, it has to be empty. So we're very greedy that way. Like, we're going to go camp out in your subnet, and we expect to be the only camper hanging out in the subnet. That's done for technical reasons, because some of the back, uh, back end management handshakes we do with Azure Networking, for example, we need to make sure we're the only one in your subnet. Otherwise, things get very confusing very quickly um, underneath the hood for the management plane. 
So if we take a look at all the subnets, the SQL Server is sitting in that first one in corporate resources. As you can guess from the naming convention, my front-end MVC app is in the internet-facing subnet, and my ILB ACE is in the internal subnet. And then you'll see why I have the gateway subnet there uh, in a few minutes. So you notice there's an NSG, right? A network security group that's on that internal subnet. So let's go take a look at uh, network security groups and drill into that specific one. And so, now, in the, in the case of this demo, right, the reality is since the API app is inside of the VNet, and it's just like my front end ACE that's calling it, I could get away with not having a network security group. But I specifically made a slight modification just so we could talk to it. What I did is I created an NSG on the subnet, and I added one and only one rule, which is this first one I have highlighted here. And I wanted to call it out because, again, from our experience working with customers, what happens from time to time is either somebody tries to create an ACE and it never comes back, like you wait four or five hours and you're like, where did it go to? Like it never seems to create. And the other scenario is folks can create a private app service environment. They come in a week later and suddenly there's this scary blue bar saying it went unhealthy. And you're like, oh my God, what happened? And one of the most common cases is just accidentally, either up front or somewhere down the road, we had access blocked to ports 454 and 455. So those are the ports that our management plane used to connect to your ACE and communicate with it and, for example, do things like, hey, it's time to go upgrade your OS, or guess what? It's the monthly release of new functionality in app service. Let's go roll it out. And if you end up blocking that access, we don't have any ability to manage the app service environment anywhere uh, anymore. We will end up telling you that in the portal, and then sometime later we will actually end up shutting down the ACE because it's like we can't actually do anything with it other than start it and stop it. So if you run into that, please do remember you always have to have those ports open, and you have to have it high enough in your NSG rule list so it will actually take precedence, right? You don't want to have some other rule taking precedence over it and accidentally blocking access. The other point I wanted to touch on is you notice all over the place, right, when I was doing name resolver, I was using a friendly looking host name. As you well know, again, if you work with virtual networks, making sure that you get the DNS config for your virtual network set up properly is very important. And again, I wanted to call this out because sometimes what we see is folks start working with an app service environment and everything works swimmingly well. And then later on, they will come in and set up new DNS servers for their virtual network. Or, alternatively, um, they will come in and change the DNS settings for their virtual network. And when that happens, you invariably will end up breaking our app service environments. So the thing to keep in mind is it's fine to go out and mutate your DNS settings, but if you happen to change your DNS configuration for the virtual network after the app service environment has already been created, you need to come back into the portal and there is a big restart button on the details blade for the app service environment. And if you click that, we will go through and reboot every single underlying virtual machine. And when it comes up, we will re-read and um, determine the DNS settings for your virtual network. And we will reconfigure the VMs to use your new DNS settings. So like I said, I wanted to call that out because right behind the NSG accidentally blocking access to our ACEs, the second most common problem by far that we see folks running into is something is screwed up or something changed with the DNS settings. So remember, you can always restart the ACE, which is a way of forcing us to say, hey, go, go pick up the latest DNS settings for the virtual network. And once you do that, the ACE should stabilize and it should go back to healthy again. Now, in my case, because I admit um, I am not a DNS master, what I did is I took this domain entexample.com uh, I bought it from GoDaddy, and then I delegated the domain down to Azure DNS. And you may have seen there was an announcement um, earlier this week, right, about the availability of the Azure DNS feature where you can host your zone on our DNS infrastructure. And so that's exactly what I did here with Azure DNS. Now, I would obviously never recommend 
that you do this for a production facing workload because obviously you don't want to have your internal host names and internal IP addresses sitting out there on a public DNS uh, server. But if you're doing like a proof of concept and you're sort of like me and you're like, oh, I got to go set up DNS servers on this virtual network so that I don't have to like hard code IP addresses all over the place, a super quick and dirty uh, workaround for that is what I'm showing you right here. Use Azure DNS, set up the zone there, and you can see there's my mapping for my database server, there's my API app, and also the SCM endpoint. And then again, I'll touch on this in about five minutes. You can see the front end MVC app. I've set up with Traffic Manager, so I have the C name for dub 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 set up. So keep that in mind, you know, both just from the point of view of Azure DNS, it's out there and definitely available for your use for public-facing host names, and also it's a, it's a great way just to sort of quickly get a nice simulated DNS infrastructure for sort of a POC or a, a dev environment that's running on an internal ACE. Okay, at this point we'll hop back to the deck. And we'll talk about the final scenario that I wanted to walk through, which is geo-distributed scale. And I specifically wanted to go through this one because I think by now most folks working on Azure, again, whether they're working with us on app service or working with IS VMs, they have a good idea of, yeah, there are different VM sizes. I can run a few. I can run a lot. And so they're comfortable with the idea of either using manual or auto scale to manage how many compute resources they can go throw at a specific app workload. But what folks sometimes don't think about or they come to later in their design process is it's not just about scaling a specific app, it's about scaling your footprint out inside of an Azure region and for that matter around the world. So with that quick intro, let's hop back to my laptop. And what I'm going to do first off is once again come back to my handy RDP sessions. But in this case, what we're looking at is a VM that is running in the North Europe region. So we'll once again go to our app, and that's assuming I can squint at it and get the URL correct. So okay, we went to www.entexample.com, and then similarly we're going to click in here, and once again, great, I'm looking at the same page where clearly I'm calling my API back in and getting my database data. So at this point, you're probably looking at it and going like, okay, that's nice, you RDP to a machine on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean and prove that the internet works. But there's obviously quite a bit more going on underneath the hood. So first, let's do the high level of, of what's actually going on. So first off, I've got a virtual network, a second one, set up in North Europe, and I created yet another app service environment in North Europe, and I put a second copy of my MVC app on that ACE. And then, sort of behind the scenes, I wired up my North Europe virtual network and my West US 2 virtual network with a site-to-site -site connection. So now that I've sort of got the foundation built, I made, use of, I made use of Azure Traffic Manager to front end, as it were, my public facing app. And what that allows me to do is it gives me a level of indirection between the customers out there on the internet and how they actually get to a specific instance of my app. So if you've never used Azure Traffic Manager before, what you do is you create what's called a profile, and that's how you tell Traffic Manager, what are all the different endpoints that, around the world that are running my app? And then you can give it some basic policy around, hey, Traffic Manager, this is how you should make a decision on which app instance to actually route customers to. So the most common thing is Traffic Manager will monitor the health of each app, and obviously, it's not going to point customers at an app that's failed. And it will also monitor the relative performance that it determines given where the customer is coming from and where your app instance is located. And it will try to route customers to the closest instance of your running app. And so when you put together the rest of the topology, what that means is I now let Traffic Manager decide, hey, do you want to go to the instance of my app that's running in North Europe? Or do you want to go to the instance of my app that's running in West US too? And so hopefully I'm able to give a better performance experience to customers by running in the region where those customers are located. So I'll flip back here um, over to the laptop and we'll take a look at how that's been set up uh, underneath the hood. So first off, since I'm actually sitting here um, inside, of my, uh, inside of my VM over in North Europe, what I can do is a quick NS lookup on www.entexample.com. 
And what you'll see is clearly it's going through a C name chain. And the very first thing that resolves is ent example .traffic manager net. So what I've done is I, and that's why you saw it earlier, in Azure DNS, I said, when you're looking up the IP address for the www endpoint, actually return back the traffic manager endpoint. And then we'll look at it here in a second, but the traffic manager profile is the one that determines and says, well, guess what? Since you're running in North Europe, as you can sort of guess from the naming convention I'm using, it probably makes more sense to route your request to the North Europe instance of your app service environment. And so that's how we know that, okay, from a customer facing perspective, I'm actually beaming into the North Europe version of my app. Now the other thing I can do, and this is sort of something to sort of highlight in architectural point, once again, I'm in the portal, I'm going to click into the North Europe version of my app, and then once I get um, all the items popping up here, I'm going to drill once again into the Kudu console, but in this case, I'm going to be drilling into the console that's associated with my app that's running on the other side of the Atlantic. And that's useful because it highlights a point that you need to keep in mind when you think about geographical scaling. So if I remember my IP address correctly, I believe it's 10.1.2.8 was my API endpoint. So two things. Okay, first off, because of the fact that I set up a gateway underneath the hood to connect my two virtual networks, the calls coming out of the back end of my MVC app in Europe, they are able to route across that site-to-site -site gateway, make it back into West US 2, and from there they're able to hit that internal facing API endpoint. So great, network connectivity looks good. But if you take a closer look, you'll notice the ping times are like 150 plus milliseconds. Whereas before, the ping times were like ultimately two or three milliseconds. Now, that, that isn't anything you know, that I can do about that. There's nothing that we, Azure App Service, can do about that. But when you're thinking about scaling out geographically, even though for us in Azure App Service, it's very simple to just create a traffic manager profile, wire up a couple of app instances, you're off to the races. Don't forget about the rest of your app stack that's sitting below us. Because if you've got a database or a cache, whatever it is that you're talking to out the back end, you will have to think about how do you scale those back end resources around the world. And so for example, in this case, Right, you can probably think of a few things. Hey, why don't you set up a second API app and go put it over in North Europe and maybe go put a caching layer in it. Or similarly, put the caching layer in the MVC app and maybe I can reduce the number of calls that actually have to traverse the Atlantic Ocean by 70 or 80%. But keep that in mind because in a few cases, we've seen folks where they scaled out the presentation tier, which is great, but then they just ended up completely throttling their back end because it's sitting in some region that's a thousand miles away and that requires you know, more architecture and engineering work uh, to work around. All right, and the last piece of the puzzle here, uh, just to show everyone, is inside of Traffic Manager, right? I mentioned we have a Traffic Manager profile. So in this case, I created an, a Traffic Manager profile called ENT Example. And when you do that, you know, when you click through the creation process, the first thing you're going to be asked for is, what is the DNS name that you want to use? And so this is where the entexample.trafficmanager.net host name came from. And what you will do is you will see name one or more of your URLs and point them at this DNS entry. So underneath the hood, at runtime, when the DNS resolution is happening like in a browser or in an API app, the DNS query is actually going to hit a traffic manager endpoint that's running in the same customer region. And then what will happen is Traffic Manager will look at all of the endpoints that you set up in your Traffic Manager profile. And like I said earlier, based upon typically whether or not the endpoints are healthy, aka online, and which one is closest, Traffic Manager will point your customer at the best performing endpoint. And so that's why when I'm in the North Europe VM, I go to the North Europe endpoint. And when I'm West US 2, I go to the West US 2 endpoint. Another just quick thing that you know, is not necessarily immediately obvious when you're using Traffic Manager, it's a great way to compose endpoints that are deployed on multiple services. So for example, you can have, maybe you're transitioning a web app from IaaS over to us on App Service. You can add a Traffic Manager endpoint that points at the web app running on an IaaS VM, and you can add an endpoint that's pointing at the same web app running on App Service. 
And like when you see here these statuses enabled, you can actually come in there and say, okay, I'm going to turn off the IS endpoint and turn on app service. Or no, I'm going to turn off the app service endpoint and instead turn on the IS endpoint. So there's actually some pretty cool things you can do with that. Another thing is Traffic Manager has an endpoint called an external endpoint. And that's just vernacular for something that's not running in Azure. So taking that same example, you could actually have a version of your app running on-premises, maybe in your data center, your existing colo, whatever, and you can register it in a traffic manager profile. And you can also add a second endpoint for maybe a new version of the app that's running on us. And then you can sit there and toggle back and forth, and you can also do some creative things in terms of disaster recovery failover scenarios. So keep that in mind because, you know, i got to tell you, Traffic Manager, once you get into it, very simple to use and incredibly powerful for giving you that extra degree of leverage that sits between your customers and the actual app endpoints that you're routing them to. Okay, so switch back to the deck here one last time and just sort of summarize things to round out the talk. So you've definitely seen today, I showed you that on app service, you can run any of the four canonical workloads, right? Web apps mobile backend as a service, API apps, and the newest member of the family, Azure Functions. And I intentionally showed you scenarios of all of those app types running in an isolated app service environment. So you can run all those app types isolated inside of your corporate virtual network, and you can lock things down using network security groups so you have greater control over that inbound traffic. And I showed you a few examples of accessing something other than just like the web app or the API app. So when you run on our service, we give you a number of different options to do things like integrating with an on-prem Azure directory by composing with AAD. You can use things like site-to-site -site connections and express route circuits so that your apps can connect to resources that are running on-premises. So you can sit there and you can move your app workloads up onto the cloud and you can still have all of your sensitive assets and resources running where they are today. And then last but not least, when your app grows up and grows around the world, it's very straightforward to be able to scale out on us into any of the 24 different regions around the world where our service exists today. So, okay, that's the talk. Thank you very much for uh, coming by, folks. Uh, definitely uh, fill out the uh, feedback forms. When you get these slides, I actually have a couple of links in here that go through a lot of the things I touched on. Shameless plug for one of my team members, uh, Adrian Hall is gonna be giving a talk tomorrow morning, Thursday, where he's going to also be talking about app service, but he's gonna go over it from the point of view of like, how do I do CI, CD on app service? What's a deployment slot? How can I use that? And he's also gonna be intermixing that from the point of view of writing a mobile backend as a service. So if you just want to see sort of what you can do on app service, regardless of public or app service environments, that's a great talk to go to. So again, thank you. I'll be up here for questions. And then also right after this, I'm heading down to the expo floor.